my goodness. But hey, good morning, you guys. Morning. morning. Welcome back. And believe it or not, I'm here again. Oh, my goodness. I am testing your patience today. How much can you endure of Stephen Schiltz in the pulpit? And hopefully, hopefully enough, hopefully enough you can endure of this. But uh, we're still talking, folks, about this idea of what would Jesus think? And Kathy, I do want to tell you, thank you for sharing what you shared today, you know, because it's so important to get our head up above where it needs to be, right? Set your mind on things above, Jesus told us. So actually, Paul wrote it, but Jesus told it, okay? And and there's this scene in The Hobbit. Anybody watch the movie The Hobbit? What, Jerry? Oh my goodness. Did you at least read the book? He's not even going to answer that one. He's not going to dignify that question with a response this morning, right? Anyway, in the book, there's this place called Mirkwood that the gold and the dwarves all get lost in called Mirkwood, okay? And Mirkwood is deep, dark, and disorienting because of it, okay? And so there's all this confusion as these guys are walking around, and they get this bright idea, or Bilbo gets this bright idea that he's got to climb a tree and get up above the canopy to see what's really going on. And he gets this boost of hope. That doesn't actually happen in the book. It happens in the movie, okay? But anyway, he gets up above the treetops, and it's bright, and it's sunny, and there's butterflies and fresh air. And then he has to go back down into Mirkwood. And sometimes we get stuck living in Mirkwood, where all we see is confusion and disorder and chaos and darkness and frustration. You're going to find what you go looking for. Okay? The Bible is very clear on that. You're going to find what you go looking for. Your brain is efficient in that it's always collecting evidence of what you believe, which is why it's important to change your beliefs. Because if your beliefs are bad, you're going to find bad everywhere you look. But if your beliefs are good, you're going to find good everywhere you look, even when you're surrounded by bad. That's the promise of the Bible, okay? And so we're going to be talking about what would Jesus say. Hey, thank you for that, Jim Concert. I appreciate that. All right. So what would Jesus think? Again, it's this idea, if I want to live the life Jesus lived, that's the gospel. You and I are called to live the life Jesus lived, okay? In American Christianity, we get this wrong where we think we get saved, so now I can get go and do my own thing, Stan. I'm free to go do whatever I want, live however I want, because Jesus died for me. No, Jesus died for you, so you can die to you. Okay, And so the goal of the gospel is to live the life that Jesus lived, not the life that you want to live. Okay, And so if I want to live the way that Jesus lived, I need to change the way that I think. I need to think the way he thought. And last week, I spent a lot of time talking about this. And hopefully, I communicated this well, but it's this idea that your truth has to outweigh your experiences. You can't get caught and stuck in your experiences. And I tried to share that through the story of Mary. Okay? Do you remember in scripture, whenever somebody would come up to Mary and talk to her and kind of confirm, you know, what had been prophesied to her or whatever had been um, spoken by the angels, there's this little tag that you'll find, especially in Matthew, okay, if you read the book of Matthew, the first few chapters, it'll say this, that Mary stored all these things up in her, in her heart, in her heart. She stored up the truth the prophecy, the confirmation of the truth, what she didn't store up in her heart. And let's learn a mess lesson from Mary this morning. She didn't store up the rejection and the shame and the fear, which is what she was experiencing. But rather, she stored up and she treasured the truth in her heart. And that's a good lesson for you and I to learn every single day of the week, all right? And so truth must outweigh your experience. And it's this idea your experiences are valid. I tried to communicate this last week. I didn't do a good job of this. But your experiences are valid, but they are not suitable foundations, okay? Wood is a valuable resource, right? John, wood's a valuable resource. How good is it to build a foundation for your house out of wood, though? Uh-uh. Not a good idea. Your experiences are valid, but just because they're valid doesn't make them suitable for foundation material, okay? And the only suitable foundation is truth, truth. And what do I mean by truth? This guy right here, truth. Or if you want, you could go back and listen to our core series where Brother Kirk Snaza taught on truth 
in our, in our core beliefs or our core values here at COC. And I keep going back to this, this solid rock pattern where you have to start with the foundation of truth because then truth influences your beliefs and then your beliefs influence your perspective and then your perspective then influences your experience. But we get it wrong where we base so much of our lives and our decisions and our reactions on what we are experiencing right now. Come on, Bilbo, get out of Mirkwood. Climb a tree. Get your head above the clouds. Okay? Get up where you need to be. Get your mind on things above, not down here in Mirkwood, because if you keep your head in Mirkwood, all you're going to see is Mirkwood. Okay? Didn't know I was going to be teaching on The Hobbit today. Oofta. That came out of nowhere. And it's this idea. I have a good question for you today. Would you rather, would you rather be bitten by a snake or eaten by a lobster? No, I'm kidding. Okay? <laughs> would you rather have God's truth influence your experiences, right? Or would you rather have your experiences influence truth? And when we live in a sinking sand pattern of thinking where I base my beliefs on experience, my experience then influence what I believe to be true. And that's not how we're supposed to live. That's not how we're called to live. Okay? Jesus didn't die so you could think bad thoughts. Okay? Okay? Jesus died so you can have his mind and his thinking so that you can live his life, right? And so I would rather have God's truth influence my experiences, all right? And then I took you into the Jesus mind trick last week, this idea where Jesus, everything he experienced on the cross was disgraceful. Everything he experienced from being betrayed, whether it was by Judas or being betrayed by Peter, whether it was having his beard ripped out, okay? whether it was having uh, people spit in his face. Remember, he's God. He's God. And, and all that is happening to him. But the truth is, and I tried to take you to um, Isaiah to show you this, is that even though he was disgraced, everything he was experiencing was disgraceful. He wasn't disgraced. Why? Well, because he didn't lose sight of who he was or what he was called to do in spite of his experience on the cross, before the cross, after the cross, okay? He never let that influence or allow him to lose sight of who he was or what he was called to do. And so it's this idea that your responses, because that's true, that for Jesus, it can be true for you and I, that our responses don't have to be dependent upon our experiences. You get to choose how you respond, Sometimes you don't, though. Did you catch that? You get to choose how you're going to respond. A lot of times, you don't choose, though. You just allow yourself to react. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Come on. Your responses, they don't have to be dependent upon your experiences. And it's this idea, how you respond to what life throws at you doesn't have to be dictated by what life throws at you. Okay? Jesus made up his mind he wasn't going to be disgraced, even though he was being disgraced. Mary made up her mind that she was going to be highly favored, even though every experience she had up to the birth of Jesus wasn't favorable. And then we could go on because now the death warrant gets issued by Herod. And now they got to skedaddle to Egypt, right? You who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. But what did Mary do? She stored up and treasured the truth in her heart so that her experience didn't influence truth. Rather, truth influenced her experiences. And it's this idea, Jesus lived above his experiences, and therefore, so can I, Jerry. You are right on. You are right on. Well, he's Jesus, and he's God, and he can do whatever he wants, you bet. But then he somehow decided to package that power in you. And what are you doing with it? Are you living in Mirkwood, or are you living above, right? Get your head up there where you need to be, all right? And then I took you to this idea of training your brain, these daily habits of mind renewal, right? I got to read God's word. I got to declare. I have much to say about de declarations. Not for this series right now, but just ask Zechariah how important what you say matters or how important what you say is, okay? Zechariah, who when uh, the angel Gabriel visits him, 
right? Gabriel's one of the one of the angels, right? He's not just one of the random angels. He's one of the angels, right? And Gabriel shows up in the temple and tells Zechariah, hey, Lord bless you. God's going to do what you've been praying for. And, and Zechariah starts to go, I don't think, zip. And he couldn't say anything. He couldn't say anything because Gabriel didn't want him to screw it up. And your words screw up your life. And your thoughts screw up your words. And so let's take it to the source, folks, okay? And so I got to get in the habit of reading, declaring, praying, listening, and obeying, reading God's word for truth, declaring his promises over my life and circumstances, praying and listening for wisdom and thoughts regarding my life and my situations and my circumstances, and then ultimately not stopping short, but obeying, obeying, obeying what God is asking me to do in the process, right? But Marnie had an interesting thought last week is, is that the goal is to eventually, yes, move beyond these, move beyond reading, declaring, pray, listening, and obeying, but never forsake them, right? I told you, you can't have football practice. I told you like this last week, you can't call it football practice if you don't work on stance, start, blocking, and tackling, okay? That was my belief. I couldn't call it football practice if we didn't work on those four things. Those four things. Now, did we work on plays at football practice? Well, yeah, we did eventually. But I wasn't going to teach my players a play until they got down stance, start, blocking, and tackling. Because they needed those fundamentals. If they didn't have those fundamentals, it didn't matter what kind of play I showed them. Because without the right fundamentals... You can know everything. Nicodemus, remember Nicodemus? You can know everything, but still know nothing, Nicodemus, unless you're born again, unless your mind is made new. And that's the idea. We've got to get those fundamentals ready in order to move past, but you can't move past until you get those fundamentals right. All right. So, new material today. Stewarding the mind of Christ, and the tag here is... Don't just have it. Don't just have it. What do I mean by that? Well, we've been given access to God's wisdom. We've been given access to God's wisdom, but what are we doing with it, folks? What am I doing with it? I've been given access to everything that God knows to be true, okay, in written form, but then also in prayer form, okay? And so if I have the access, what am I doing with the access that I have, okay? It's like giving somebody the key to the house. You know, do you remember on, was it the Price is Right? Oh, my goodness. Where, where was it that you got, like, a key at the end, and you got to see if it, if it started the car, and if it started the car, you got to keep the car? Oh, my goodness. Nobody knows the answer to this question. Tune in next week while we figure this out, right? I think it was The Price is Right. Imagine this. Bob Barker hands Kathy the key. Kathy Concert, come on down. You're the next contestant on The Price is Right. And he hands her the key, and she goes, nah, I'm good. Puts it in her pocket and walks off the stage, right? How weird would that be? But here, you've been given access to the wisdom of the kingdom of God. Yeah, I'm good, right? And that's what we do with it. We do with it all the time, but we got to make sure we're stewarding it, stewarding it, putting it to use, growing it, training it. We've got to steward the mind of Christ because Paul writes to us this, 1 Corinthians 2.16, we have, but we have the mind of Christ. And I don't want you, and Paul doesn't want you just to have it. He wants you to utilize it because you already have it. It's a gift that you've been given, but what are you and what am I doing with that gift? That's the big question that I want to kind of wrestle with for a little bit. I'm going to show you a photo. Look at that little boy there. Just cute. Oh my goodness. Now Shaggy. Hi Shaggy. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> He's shaking his head and rightly so, right? Look at that. Look at that. I don't know how old Elliot is in that photo. He's young, younger. Okay. But allow me to direct your attention to this. That's Elliot's drawing. Okay. Now, Elliot shared during the Christmas program, and I don't know if you caught it or not. Okay. 
But he said something interesting when Marnie was talking to Elliot about his gift. And he said, I have the gift of creativity, but drawing is something that I work at. Okay? It's that idea that Elliot's been given a gift to draw. He can draw amazing things. He can think up amazing things in his mind and put it down on paper and just go with it. And, and I, can't, I can't even compete with him. I, you don't want to see my drawings compared to his drawings. right? It's, but, but he works at drawing. So much so that he's probably working on a drawing right now. And if you see him later today, he'll be working on another drawing. And if you talk to him later tonight, he'll be working on another drawing. And if you try and reach out to him tomorrow after school, he'll probably be working on another drawing. It's something that he works at. It's something that he doesn't just let sit dormant inside of him. It's something that he's been given a gift to, to be creative, but he works at it. And that's the idea that Paul's trying to hit at here. You have the mind of Christ, but it ain't that easy, folks. You know that to be true. You know that to be true. It ain't that easy to just think thoughts that Jesus would think. You got to work at it. You got to do something about it. You got to apply that gift that's been given. And so we've got to be using our gift of the mind of Christ by stewarding that gift because ultimately stewarding your mind well is going to allow you to steward any season well, especially the bad ones, right? And that's, that's the power of the Holy Spirit is that you and I can produce good fruit in bad seasons, but it comes from our mindset and, and how we're thinking about things. And so, and so the goal is if I'm dealing with difficult seasons in life, which we all have difficult seasons, okay? We're, a lot of times we get in, stuck in this transition where we think that our season is the exception to God's rule, Oh, God wasn't thinking about my circumstance when he wrote that in the Bible, right? No, that's not true, okay? Your experience, your situation, your season was included in that. And so if we steward our minds well, we can steward our seasons well. All right, we're going to take off today in stewarding the mind of Christ. And I'm going to introduce to you the Jesus stack. The Jesus Stack. Any IHOP fans here? I'm not talking, I apologize, I'm not talking about the International House of Prayer. I'm talking about the International House of Pancakes. My children love IHOP. They were very sad when the one in Watertown closed, okay? But they love IHOP, right? And so I'm going to introduce you to the Jesus Stack. Well, what is IHOP and how does pancakes make it into here? Well, IHOP stands for this, all right? These are what I consider to be building blocks or key components for you and I to steward the mind of Christ in our lives, okay? It stands for identity, humility, obedience, and purpose, okay? That's the IHOP, identity, humility, obedience, and purpose, all right? And to get the IHOP or the Jesus stack, I'm going to take you to Philippians. So please, if you got your Bible, I'd love for you to turn to Philippians today. And we're going to be reading in Philippians 2. And if I can, I'm going to bite off verses 5 through 11. But if I can't, no worries. Because I want you to see something that I felt Holy Spirit kind of showing me in Scripture, okay? And how do I steward, right? How do I steward the mind of Christ? Well, part of it is those daily habits of mind renewal, right? Read, declare, pray, listen, obey, okay? But part of it is encased in this passage of Scripture here in Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11. And so I'm just going to start with verses 5 through 6 right now because the first building block for the Jesus stack, is identity. Identity. We've got to get identity right. And so I want you to read something and see something here in Scripture. And so this is Paul writing here. And, uh, and he writes this. He says, your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus, right? Have the same mindset, have the same pattern of thinking. You have the mind of Christ, so you have the attitude of Christ, okay? And who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something 
to be grasped. Now, I underline the word grasped there, and who has a different translation than I do? Anybody have a different word than grasped? Jim, what is the word that you have? Used for his own benefit. Used for his own benefit, okay, okay. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Used to his own advantage. Used to his own advantage. Ooh, I like that also, definitely. Zach, you are the winner of today's door prize. I don't really know what it, I've got, I've got a pen here from the Comfort Inn, uh, but yes, see me after church. Anyway, but that word grasped is important to know, okay, because the, the Bible isn't written in English. Well, it, I can read it. It's in English. Yes, but it wasn't written in English, all right? It was written in Aramaic, and then it was translated into Greek, and the word there, grasped, has an interesting meaning. It means to be taken by force, to grab something by force or to grab something out of fear or out of lack. Like uh, in, uh, if you read it uh, like a word study, it would talk about how kind of like when you steal something, okay? Because you're afraid of being poor or going hungry, you really think you need that and so you, you try to take it by force, okay? Or use it to your own advantage, okay? And so that word grasp there is, is important to understand that because I want you to realize this, Jesus, so the first stack, the first pancake in IHOP is identity, okay? That's what's going to go down the, on the plate. Jesus wasn't afraid of losing who he was. That's why that, it's under, important to understand that word grasp there. Jesus, who was equal, very in the same nature with God, he wasn't afraid of losing that nature, and that's important because he was going to experience things that weren't natural to him. Right? Where did Jesus come from? Heaven. Right? Right? And would you agree or disagree that things in heaven have a different natural than things on earth? They have a supernatural component, right? And so Jesus down here on earth is going to experience some things in the natural and so he never was afraid, though, of losing his nature. So that first piece, the first stack of the pancake, is my identity. And Jesus didn't struggle. Think about it like this. He didn't, he didn't struggle with insecurity. Okay, insecurity is the opposite of identity. When you are afraid, you know, uh, if you've been in the restaurant with children and the children are acting up, and you're thinking to yourself, oh, no, people are going to think I'm a bad parent because my kids are misbehaving. Kids misbehave. They have for millions of years. Okay? They've always misbehaved. Some adults still do too. Okay? <laughs> right? People misbehave. Kids misbehave. And so if you're in the restaurant worried that people are going to think you're a bad parent because your kids are misbehaving, those people, you can't you shouldn't listen to them because they don't have kids then. Okay? And never did right? It's, it's like, think about Jesus like this. You think he ever went around worried that people were going to think he was a bad rabbi because Peter was going to put his foot in his mouth again? He never had to worry about that. He never dealt with any insecurity. Uh, think about it like this. Whenever Jesus, or whenever people question Jesus about who he was, he never gave people a clear answer. You ever see that in scripture? Now, some of you, that might bother you. I know it bothers some scholars. It doesn't bother me because I know this to be true, that Jesus knew exactly who he was. He didn't feel the need to defend himself. Or think about it like this. He never got rattled when people accused him of being something he wasn't. That's why as he's on a cross and soldiers and Pharisees are hurling insults at him, and people are walking by and saying, you said you were the son of God. If that's true, come off of the cross, and then we'll believe in you. That's why Jesus could stay there and go, I am the son of God. Oh, yeah, by the way, you're forgiven. In that moment, it's not like he got torqued and just ripped his hands off and said, all right, I'm going to show you folks something, right? No, no. He was obedient to the point of death, and he never was afraid that he was going to lose his nature. He never worried about it. It couldn't be taken from him. 
It couldn't be robbed from it. It's not something that could be grasped. It couldn't be taken by someone else's force. And it's this idea that when you don't doubt your identity, it doesn't matter when other people do. Because people are going to doubt your identity. But then you got to make up your mind. Either you are who God says you are, or you aren't. And so we've got to make up our mind. And Jesus knew exactly who he was. Think about it like this, because he knew exactly who God was. Because true identity is knowing who I am and who you are in Christ. And in order for me to know who I am, I need to know who God is. Remember, Genesis 1.26, we are created in the image of God. God created man in his image, okay? And so we've got to know, we've got to have a clear view of who God is because a clear view of God gives me a clear view of who I am, okay? And we got to dig in, though. We got to dig in here because as you dig into who God is and who Jesus is, you're going to find who you and I are are called to be. We've got to dig in. We've got to dig in. And our identity, and I know this is kind of going to sound like a repeat, but our identity is not dictated by our experiences. Who I am in Christ has nothing to do with what I experience in life. But it has everything to do with how I can respond to what I experience. Right? Who I am in Christ has nothing to do with what I experience in life. Jesus told you, in this world, you're going to have trouble. You are. But take heart, for I've overcome the world. And so because, because that's true, I know that my identity then doesn't have to be dictated by my experiences. Think about it like this. You're not the sum of your experiences. A lot of times that's what we think in our life, that we are the sum total of our experiences. And so if I have a lot of bad experiences, my life was bad. Did you know that you can have a lot of bad experiences and your life can still be good? Okay, And it's, it just depends on what you go looking for. And you're going to find what you go looking for. Stan, you said it to us like this one time in youth. I think it was in youth. Or maybe Kirk was quoting Stan in youth. But you said something like this, the same circumstances, and you might even be able to finish this thought, the both of you, the same set of circumstances that make one man an alcoholic will make another man a preacher. The same set of circumstances that you go through in life can make one man an alcoholic and one man a preacher. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean, well, okay, so that's predestination then, right? So God destined this guy to be, you know, uh, an alcoholic. And so that's why he let him have those experiences. And, and uh, God wanted this guy to be a preacher. And so that's why he's, no, no, they chose because they get to, they chose how to respond to those circumstances. One chose the low road, the other chose the Jesus road, right? And it's, it's this idea that I can't let my bad experiences derail me from who I've been created to be or what I'm called to do, okay? I can't. You're gonna have bad experiences in life. You are, you are, but that doesn't define you. If you're willing, it'll actually enhance you because it'll help shore up some cracks in your foundation. It'll help you to realize that maybe my experiences aren't what I should be basing my beliefs on. And maybe it's time to start living in truth and walking in truth and not just reading truth. Okay? And so it's this idea of I've been given the mind of Christ. You and I have been given the mind of Christ, but what in the world are we doing about it? Okay? It's going to take time. It's going to take time, and it's not, I've said this many, many times, it's not a one-time fix. It's not a quick fix. These are daily habits, things that we need to apply to our lives on a daily basis 
and then allow our mind to be renewed, and then now I can start with identity. Now, how many times do you think you need to hear a message on your identity in Christ? Every day, Jerry. Every day you need to be reminded of who you are in Christ. Every day you need to be reminded, especially on days where you ain't looking like him. Okay? You need to be reminded of who you are in Christ. I'm going to leave you with a passage. It's not too far away. It's uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, and I don't have it on the projector for you, so you're going to have to go paper mode here, okay? Paul's writing to the Corinthians in his second letter, and he says this, and we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the spirit. And what do I mean by this thing is it's this idea that we, we, we sometimes we have distorted images of God, right? Uh, we went to a house of mirrors one time with our kids. There was like this big mirror maze. We were on a trip with my mom and dad and, and uh, we had the kids and we were going through this mirror maze and he had to be really careful walking through this mirror maze because it was trippy, it was messing with your brain of where you could walk and where you couldn't walk, and you didn't want to just face plant right into a mirror, right? And there's all this distortion around you, right? Like Merck would, okay? But what is going to get rid of that distortion is when I get a clear view, a clear view of who God is, an uninterrupted view of God, an uninterrupted, un uninterrupted view of God. Uh, think about it like this. Have you, uh, do you remember in scripture, it's in Jeremiah, uh, where uh, you've heard maybe the passage, uh, if you seek me, you'll find me. Do you know that passage? It's Jeremiah 29, 13. Anyway, that's not the whole verse. Anybody remember what the whole verse is? You will seek, if you seek me, you will find me when you seek me with all your heart or your whole heart. And so a lot of our issues with what we're thinking are rooted in our issues of identity because we're not seeking him with our whole heart where we've got our eyes Marnie talked about this. Trisha talked about this. Lots of people talked about this this morning where our gaze has to be fixed completely and wholly on him so that we only see what he is showing. I've been praying a prayer all week this week. It's kind of rooted in John 5, 19. It's kind of rooted in John 12, 49. But it's this idea that Jesus never said anything that God wasn't saying. And Jesus never did anything that God was doing. And Jesus never thought something that God wasn't thinking. And Jesus never heard something that God wasn't speaking. And I want that in my life. I want that singleness of focus where, Heavenly Father, help me to only see what you show. Heavenly Father, let me only hear what you say. Lord, let me only declare what you are declaring over my life. And as we start to pursue singleness, as we start to get our identity right, we start to live out the life that Jesus lived. And I'll have to leave you off there, you guys. Amen? Let's pray.